Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening, how are you? Well, thank you, good. Um, so now, um, uh, housekeeping things. Uh, first of all, obviously we're looking, to, looking forward to a terrific class this evening with uh, Professor Pam Ronald, but before that, uh, the usual rules, please, no phones, uh, no uh, computers open, no watching house, as some of you were doing earlier on, which I was impressed by. Um, I will be on family leave for the next two weeks, so I, w I won't be having office hour next Monday or the Monday after, uh, but I'll be back on May the 5th. Um, we have uh, the usual uh, opportunities to, to make up absences and, and look for redemption, but they're coming at slightly different times. So this week, um, Nora's discussion section will happen not tomorrow, but on Wednesday between 11 and 12 in 3106 Etcheverry Hall. That's Wednesday between 11 and 12 in 3106 Etcheverry Hall. Uh, all, of this, all, all of what I am saying will be uh, pinged to you and broadcast in the appropriate ways on B courses, but uh, just giving you a heads up that it won't happen tomorrow between 5, 10, and 6, but will happen on Wednesdays. Um, we also have three other uh, extra credit opportunities, um, two of them in Berkeley and one of them in San Francisco. Uh, you will find details on these, again, sent to you on B courses, but there is a sustainability summit on Wednesday, April 23rd, between 2 and 5.30 p.m., a food career panel on Thursday, April 24th, between 5 and 8, uh, both of those are here in Berkeley, and then uh, the Our Land Summit on the 26th and 27th of April uh, in San Francisco. And all of those will be opportunities to gain extra credit if you've missed a class or haven't responded to a question in the appropriate way. Uh, oh, on top of that, uh, someone left this behind last week. Does anyone recognize this? No? All right. Um, and I think, oh, that's right. So next. Next week, uh, next week's class is on labor in the food system, and we'll have the Coalition of Immokalee Workers uh, and Berkeley's own Saru Jayaraman presenting, and Anna LaPay will be guest hosting that. Um, finally, there are question cards this evening. We do anticipate there'll be lots of questions. The questions you've submitted, the students have submitted, have been already terrific. If there are other questions, uh, just hand, you know, write out your question card, and people will be around to collect it when, come, when it comes time for us to be doing that. But I will hand over now to Michael, who will introduce Pam Ronald. get that new uh, battery yet. Evening, everybody. How's everyone doing? Happy Passover. They said that your sound did play. Um, this evening, we're going to explore a very contentious subject in uh, agriculture and beyond, uh, the genetic engineering of crops. Uh, as we've mentioned, beginning with Joel Salatin's class a couple weeks ago, we transitioned from looking at the problems of industrial agriculture to exploring some of the different avenues for solving those problems. Um, to many people, including our guest tonight, genetic engineering deserves to be considered in that category as a solution to some of the problems of industrial agriculture. And yet, as you know from your readings, there are many other people who regard genetic engineering as something quite different, as yet another problem of industrial agriculture, or at least as a symptom of its problems. So tonight, what we hope to provide you with is the information uh, and ideas to help you come to your own conclusion about that. Um, and if anyone can make a case for the value, indeed the necessity, of genetic engineering to make agriculture more sustainable and feed the world, it is our guest, Dr. Pamela Ronald. Pam speaks from direct experience of the subject. She is herself a genetic engineer and has done pioneering work engineering rice for resistance to disease and tolerance to flooding, which seriously threatens rice crops in Asia and Africa. She did this work at UC Davis, uh, where she's professor in the Department of Plant Pathology and the university's Genome Center. Pam has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and is an elected fellow of the American, Academy, uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. We're fortunate to have someone with us tonight who can talk about not just how this work is done, um, who can talk not just about the, the political debate around it, but actually help us with the nuts and bolts of how it works, which is something you don't hear a lot about when you read all the sound and fury around the topic. Pam is also deeply engaged as a science commu communicator, in science communications as a writer and public speaker. 
She's the author, with her husband, uh, Raoul Adamchak, of this important book, Tomorrow's Table. And if you want to follow up on any of the ideas you hear tonight, this would be a very good place to start. Um, Bill Gates called it a fantastic piece of work. In recent years, Pam has played an important role in the political debates surrounding genetic engineering. Uh, as, as Raj said, we've distributed question cards. So if you have questions during your presentation, or if you're members of the community with questions, uh, that'll be your chance. We'll collect them after she finishes and, uh, and try to ask as many of them from the stage as we can. So will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Pam Ronald. <laughs> Thank you, it's very nice. <laughs> Thank you for the very nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. And Michael forgot the most important thing. I was a student here at UC Berkeley and uh, loved it. And remember uh, riding my bike with my dog close behind, zipping across campus in the morning. So it's really a pleasure to be back. Thank you all for coming. And for those of you who have a holiday uh, this evening and are not uh, at your Seder dinner, uh, doubly thanks uh, for coming tonight. So tonight, uh, we'll discuss one of the greatest challenges of our time, how to feed the growing population without further destroying the environment. And we probably don't want that on top, right? So the tech whizzes will Never seen that before. Seen Always. Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. okay. So let's move on. So um, the world's population is expected to increase from the current 7 billion to a predicted 9 or 10 billion by the end of the century. And so that's equivalent to adding uh, the population of two Chinas. So how are we going to feed uh, the world? Obviously, there are many complicated issues, political, social, economic, a wide range of challenges uh, that we need to address. Uh, tonight, I will be uh, focusing on agriculture. So in the past, we would grow more food. We'd expand farmland to other land. Uh, but we can't, we can't do that anymore. Most of the arable land is already farmed. In fact, if you focus a little bit on the slide, on top is the blue sky. And this is a steep, steep hillside in Ecuador. So this is typical of the lengths that farmers are doing to try to eke out more food on a little bit of land. And my husband, the Central Valley farmer, always looks in shock at this slide. He can't imagine farming on such a hillside. 70% of the world's water is all, fresh water is already used for farming, and the demand for fresh water is expected to increase dramatically. That means that we need to have a sustainable intensification, produce more food using the same amount of land and less water. Plants, uh, like humans, get infections. So this is a, um, a pathogen that is infecting a tobacco plant. It's related to the pathogen that caused the Irish potato famine in the 1850s, uh, which contributed to the death of a million farmers, and a million more people emigrated, many to the United States, including uh, Obama's great-great-great-grandfather. So plant pathogens can change the course of history. So this is, a, I should say, a four-day time-lapse video. These pathogens can be devastating. So it's possible to control some, some pathogens, not all, but some can be controlled with spraying pesticides. However, often these, some of these pesticides can be quite toxic, and often they're not used safely. So here's a potato farmer in Peru. He's posing for the camera, smiling. He has no uh, protection on his hand, nothing on his face. He's spraying his boot. There are children that are spraying pesticides in less developed countries. For this reason, because of this lack of safety, the World Health Organization estimates that 300,000 people die every year from pesticide poisoning. Most of these deaths occur in the less developed countries. The predicted effects of climate change are posing additional challenges for agricultural production. You're probably familiar with the effects of drought and heat. This is a farm in Australia. And, but global climate change can also bring flooding to where it's not wanted. And this is a field in Bangladesh. These boys are walking through their family's rice field. 
Most rice varieties like to grow in water, paddy rice, but if rice plants are completely submerged for more than three days, virtually all rice varieties will die. This is a, a terrible problem, especially in regions such as Bangladesh, where people get two-thirds of their calories from rice. Now, in developing nations, 50 to 80 percent of the food is wasted before it reaches the table. This is um, partly because there is poor storage, poor infrastructure, difficulty in transporting the food. That's, when we think of food waste in the United States, in Europe, it's a very different situation. Most of the food wasted here is wasted after it's put on the table, after we've invested water, energy, fertilizers, time, labor into producing the food. So clearly we can change our uh, customer behaviors so that we don't have this type of waste. But today what I'm talking about is agriculture. This is my husband, Raul Adamchak. He's talking to students at the UC Davis Student Farm. He's been an organic farmer for 35 years. And uh, what he and I, we, we talk about these problems of agriculture uh, quite often. We both like plants. We talk about plants. Uh, Davis is an agricultural community. So we think about this a lot. Now, some people may think that a geneticist and an organic farmer represent polar opposites of an agricultural spectrum. And some people often wonder if we even can talk to each other. Um, but we can. And that's because we have the same goal, which is an ecologically based system of uh, production of food. Now still, many of our friends and family and colleagues have asked us, uh, can plant genetics contribute to sustainable agriculture? Is genetically engineered food safe to eat? Can organic agriculture feed the world? So in response to those questions, we wrote this book together. And really what our goal is to give the reader insight into what a geneticist does and what an organic farmer actually does. And we also try to distinguish between fact and fiction in the debate on crop genetic engineering. Now tonight, what I hope you will leave this lecture with having a little bit more information on plant breeding and genetics, what we mean by ecologically based farming practices, um, a better understanding what, what plant GMOs actually are, and most importantly is why we need to embrace seed and farming methods that are good for the environment and good for consumers. So let's start with plant breeding and genetics. This is a, a slide that um, courtesy of Peggy Lameau, who's in the audience. And uh, the purpose of this slide is to remind you uh, that we have relied on genetically improved seed for 10,000 years now. And when I speak of genetic improvement, there are many methods of genetic improvement. This particular example shows you the ancient ancestor of modern day corn. On the top is the ancestor uh, called Teosinte. And this is what corn looked like about 10,000 years ago. To get at the nutritious grain inside, you have to break open the grain with a hammer. Through modern uh, genetic approaches and hybrid, well, first I should say through our ancestors' primitive domestication, so this breeding really started 8,000 years ago and then accelerated over the last 300 years, we now have modern-day corn, which uh, produces a hundredfold more grain for each uh, acre of land. So it's much more production, productive. And this type of genetic improvement is called hybridization. We could talk a little bit more about that later if you like. Now, we can't rely on seed alone. Farming practices are also critically important. And it's, uh, this is one of the reasons that organic agriculture began. It was really in response to overuse of pesticides and fertilizers. And the goal of organic farming is to try to have an ecologically based system. So, Typically, uh, organic farmers will have a very diverse crop on their farm. This is my husband's farm at UC Davis, and he, he's always looking for volunteers in the summer, so you can come up there. If, it gets, if it's too cool down here in the summer, just, just come on up. So you can see he's growing a diversity of crops, and this is very important because if you have a greater genetic diversity, your crop is less vulnerable to epidemics. So if your broccoli is susceptible to a particular pathogen, your carrots are probably doing pretty well. So it sort of buffers 
um, environmental and uh, biotic factors. Or organic farmers also will, um, they're not allowed to use synthetic fertilizers, so they fertilize their crops using uh, compost. There's a big compost operation on, on the farm, and they try to foster soil fertility through crop rotation and cover crops. Now, US, if you're an organic farmer, you rely on genetically improved seed. Virtually everything in organic farmer plants, like every farmer plant, is a seed that um, has been modified somehow. But there's a particular type of seed that's not allowed, and those are called GMOs. So I wanted to start with my first clicker question. Um, it's a tough one, so get ready. Everything in wheat is genetically altered, so what does GMO mean? And oh, first I, gotta, I remind you that the reason we genetically improve seed is for taste, for beauty, for nutrition, and for resistance to pest and disease. So what, what do, I want you to click on what genetic modifications are, can be certified organic. So when you buy certified organic produce, there are genetic modifications that are used. Some are allowed and some are not. So your goal is to click on A, B, C, or D. So if you think that self-pollination and genetic marker-assisted breeding are allowed, you can collect A. Don't click yet, because you're going to get four choices. So marker-assisted breeding uses genetic markers to, uh, to introduce genes uh, precisely into the genome. And I'll give you some examples of that later. There, another choice is self-pollination and hybridization. So hybridization, you take two very distinct uh, varieties, you cross them, and you come up with hybrid seed, and the farmer needs to go every year to repurchase the seed from a seed company, usually a large corporation, because those are the ones that are producing hybrids. If, if you self the seed and plant it, the progeny or the next generation will have all kinds of weird looking traits. So most farmers uh, don't go back and replant the seed, they buy it back from the companies. The third choice is self-pollination, hybridization, and some other uh, techniques. Embryo rescue, which is to merge genomes of two closely related species. This is a laboratory technique. Um, it's a technique that does not occur in nature, so um, science, cell biologists sort of encourage this along. And another technique is random mutagenesis using radiation or chemicals. So you take a seed, you dip it in a carcinogenic substance, or you irradiate it, you create random mutations, and then the breeder will select for those uh, seed that have traits of interest. And the fourth choice is introduction of a bacterial gene into a plant or engineering of a pepper gene into a tomato, a project my graduate advisor who's in the audience is uh, working on uh, right now. So these are your choices. That's all you get. You have to choose A, B, C, or D. Which genetic modifications are certified organic? So I don't know how the clickers work. Do we get to see the answers? Yeah, we will see the answers. They're being tabulated. OK. Here we go. I like this. OK. So for almost 50% think B is, a, is certified organic. And um, sort of distributed here. And oh, wait, it's still clicking. Real time. Those are the people waiting for the right answer. They don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> You're not expected to really know this. I'm, I, I'm trying to um, provide some information. OK. So the correct answer is C. That is the response I was looking for. It's very surprising, right? It's all these bizarre genetic techniques. They all can be certified organic. Um, now, what's not certified organic is D, introduction of a bacterial gene into a plant. Well, that's understandable. That's kind of weird. That would never happen in nature, a bacterial gene in a plant. Well, except it does happen in nature with um, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, but that occurs um, not by the scientists. And engineering a pepper gene into a tomato. Those are considered, you know, when you see no GMOs, that's usually what people mean. But what I wanted to show you by this is that no one really knows what GMO means, because there is no definition of GMOs. If you go to the FDA, you can't really even find a definition. So OK, so let's um, now talk about 
This next question, and you don't have to click on this, I'm just going to give you the answer because I was a student here too and I know how it feels. Okay, which genetic modifications have the least risk of unintended consequences? Well, this gets a little more complicated. So self-pollination actually has the least risk of unintended consequences. And this base is based on the uh, categorization of the National Academy of Sciences. And this, again, is sort of um, simple to understand. You have a rice plant. It self-pollinates. You collect the seed. Not much messing around. That seems like a very low risk of unintended consequences. And of course, unintended consequences means something happening that you didn't, didn't predict. But even self-pollination, there could be something strange that goes on. Maybe a pollen comes in from another plant and you get something unexpected. Um, now, the, the second one, surprisingly, is engineering of a pepper gene into tomato. Well, one of the reasons that has such a low risk is we, we eat peppers and tomatoes together all the time. These are very closely related species. So when you put a pepper gene in a tomato, you're hardly changing the genome at all. So this is considered a uh, very low risk. After that is hybridization. After that is um, embryo rescue. And you can see this is quite, uh, you're taking two different genomes together. And then finally, um, oh, introduction of bacterial gene into a plant, that's considered a higher risk of unintended consequences. But the highest risk of unintended consequences is random mutagenesis using radiation or chemicals. And that's because this is a random process. Usually you introduce maybe 100 different mutations. None of them are characterized. But this, these techniques can all be certified organic, including uh, Earth's best whole grain rice cereal. Um, very, very risky, but harmless. So I don't want you to get worried. I fed this to my children as well. It's just to give you the idea that um, the, uh, the idea of what's labeled GMO really has nothing to do of whether it's, it's risky or not. And um, we can talk about examples of unintended consequences during the Q&A if, if, that, if that comes up. So what are, now I'm going to give you some examples of genetically engineered crops, but first I want to uh, remind you that many countries are growing these crops now. 29 countries are growing genetically engineered crop. The most recent was uh, BT eggplant in Bangladesh. But what's interesting about this is so they were, these crops were introduced in 1996, and uh, this goes out about to 2013. If you look at the blue line, this is industrial uh, countries like the United States uh, and Europe. So, well, Europe's really not, not on the chart anymore, but they were, uh, Europeans were the first to develop uh, genetic engineering. So industrial companies rapid adop adoption of genetically engineered crop by farmers. But what's very interesting, if you look a couple years ago, look at this red line. Developing countries started uh, adopting these crops very slowly, but they've now surpassed. So there's more farmers in less developed countries growing genetically engineered crops than in developed countries. And these are usually very small farms, maybe a couple acre farms. So uh, why are these, so something like 90%, well, I'm sure you've talked about this, 90% of the corn, 90% of the soybean, um, uh, cotton is, is genetically engineered. So why are farmers using genetically engineered crops? And that's what I want to uh, give you an example. And I will say that most of the crops uh, first were developed in the United States by large corporations. Uh, however, very quickly the situation is changing. The uh, Joint Research Council of the European Commission estimates that by next year, most of the genetically engineered crops are going to come from national technology providers in Asia and Latin America designed for domestic markets. Everybody wants to own the technology and develop seeds for um, their, their own country. So, I'm going to run through about five examples. This is papaya infected with papaya ring spot virus. So plants get viral infections, as do humans. And this is a particularly deadly infection. In the 1950s, this pathogen destroyed the entire crop of papaya on the island of Hawaii. The farmers, uh, there was no conventional method to control the disease. There was no organic method to control the disease. They left the island. They moved to another island where the virus had not yet arrived. But by 1992, the virus was discovered in Hawaii, and the farmers again were faced with loss of their industry. By 1995, the production had plummeted 20-fold. 
Now, there's a hero to this story. His name's Dennis Gonzalez. Uh, he received his PhD at uh, UC Davis. But perhaps more importantly uh, is that he grew up in Hawaii. He's a local Hawaiian. He worked on the plantations. He, he's an ag person. He cared about this disease. He cared about the farmers and the papayas. So he was very interested in this newfangled technology called genetic engineering. And he knew that if you rub a mild strain of the virus on a papaya plant, and then you come back later and you infect with a virulent strain of the virus, the plant is resistant. So somehow that mild strain of the virus immunized the plants to infection. So this is um, sort of uh, conceptually similar, although it's mechanistically different, as getting vaccinations. You vaccinate, you're vaccinated for most of you, I hope, for measles, small uh, whooping cough, and, and other, other childhood diseases. So he developed uh, genetically engineered papaya, and this was the first field trial in 1995. And in the center is the genetically engineered papaya. I hope you can see that. On, on the outside is the conventional papaya. This is a natural field infection. And in his experiments, the papaya are completely resistant to the disease. So this is in 1995. This is really a very long time ago now. And you can see that uh, this is just a graph to show you in 1992 when the virus arrived, how quickly the production plummeted. When the genetically engineered papaya was introduced in 1998 to farmers, it was freely distributed to farmers. I should mention this is a nonprofit project. It was funded by a grant from the US Department of Agriculture of $60,000. This is a nonprofit project. And you could see the papaya production rebounded very, very quickly. And still, today, there is um, many, many years later, it's still the most effective way to control this disease. And one point I want to make is that genetic engineering is not the only technology to control diseases, for example. But sometimes it is, it is a very appropriate technology. And I think this papaya is a fantastic story because it's really an appropriate technology. Even today, 20 years later, there's still no other method to control the disease. 90, 90 95% of the papaya that we eat here in California is genetically engineered um, from Hawaii. So and my next example is um, cotton. So this is the cotton bullworm. This is an insect pest. It's emerging from its egg. This is a very, causes very serious disease on cotton. It's estimated that 25% of the world's insecticides is used to control this pest. Half of those insecticides are considered to be carcinogenic or potentially carcinogenic. So this is a very uh, important disease that needs to be controlled by all farmers. It, about 100 years ago, uh, a bacterium was characterized, Bacillus thuringiensis, which produces a small toxin that targets cotton bullworm. So it's very specific to cotton bullworm and related pests. And it can kill the pest. Now, this is something that organic farmers have taken advantage of. What uh, they use this. Uh, compound called dipel. And what this is, it's a bacteria that's been grown in large vats and um, dried. And then what they do is they spray it onto the crop. And it's very effective for controlling um, different pests. So organic farmers like it because it's, it's non-toxic to mammals. And it's considered to be um, the least toxic of, of most pesticides that are available. So geneticists, here she is cutting the DNA. Um, took advantage of this. And she actually cut the DNA out of the bacterium and engineered it into the cotton ball. And so what you have here is um, cotton, which is genetically engineered with a snippet of this uh, bacterial. So it's a gene producing a protein that when the insect bites the plant, the insect dies. I like to show this example because it's been, since 1996, we have a lot of data. So one of the frustrations, I think, for all of us when we talk about genetic engineering is often you get a lot of hand wavings. Well, what if, and if then, and maybe, and, but we can actually look back. And there's really solid scientific evidence. So we can ask, well, what has been the benefit of BT crops? Has there been a benefit? Has there been harm? Has this enhanced sustainable agriculture? So this, there was a group in, Arizona, Bruce Tabashnik and his colleagues, they've done incredible uh, work, uh, working uh, a team approach with entomologists, ecologists, breeders, 
to, to study the effects of genetically engineered cotton. What they find is that planting a Bt cotton has reduced the use of sprayed insecticide in half compared to conventional farmers, and it enhances beneficial insect biodiversity. So beneficial insects are important in the, on the farm because they don't harm the crop, but they can prey on other insects that may cause, cause some damage. Now, um, that, oh, I just wanted to say that this is understandable if you spray less insecticides, especially less broad spectrum insecticides, you're not killing everything out there. So when you have a targeted compound, this is one reason organic farmers like Bt, you, you create, it's less environmental damage. So in India, uh, actually India is the largest adop adopters of genetically engineered cotton. Again, these are very small farms, about two acres. Millions of farmers are growing genetically engineered cotton. There's a lot of data. There's a paper recently out in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences um, showing a 24% increase in yield and a 50% profit gain. And you have to remember, in less developed countries, you have these little kids that are going around spraying the insecticide. They're probably spraying their legs more than the crops. So the insecticides aren't used efficiently. Um, they lay around the farms. They cause problems. And often they're not sprayed at the right time, or maybe the farmer can't even afford them. So there's a lot of loss in less developed countries due to this insect. In China, Within four years after introduction of Bt cotton, insecticide use fell by 156 million pounds, and pesticide poisonings decreased by 75%. So these are really uh, what I believe are very clear success for it, stories for uh, human health and the environment. And uh, this uh, Bt cotton was first developed by Monsanto, and China is developing their own types of, of Bts now. But improved seed alone is just one element of sustainable agriculture. So you can't rely on seed alone to control all the problems of agriculture. And this is something farmers understand very, very well. But I think that often uh, us consumers in urban environments don't really understand that you need to couple the genetically under improved crop has to be coupled with um, farming practices that foster soil fertility, and have an integrated approach to managing pests. So for example, in China, a few years after this massive reduction in insecticide use, there was another bug started to become called mirrored that started to become more of a problem. When the farmers removed the broad spectrum insecticides, this other uh, insect that was controlled by those insecticides started to create more problems. And that insect is not controlled by Bt, so the farmer has to develop other strategies for controlling that insect. Farming is not simple. So now I want to turn um, uh, to my work. So I work on rice. Rice is a staple food for half the world's people. And I was very drawn to uh, working on rice. When I was a graduate student, I worked on peppers and tomatoes. And I like salad, but I decided as a, for a postdoc, I'd work on supper. So um, you can make small changes in the yield or productivity of rice, and you can affect millions of small farmers. So this is a, a challenge that many uh, people around the world are working on. So I, wa I want to tell you the story of flood tolerant rice. So as I mentioned, most rice varieties um, will die if they're flooded for more than three days. And this is a very serious problem in South and Southeast Asia. So this area shown in red, um, uh, you can see flooding here one or several times a year. And these floods come uh, unpredictable at unpredictable times. And they cause huge, uh, huge damage. It's estimated in Bangladesh and India alone. 4 million tons of rice, enough to feed 30 million people, is lost every year to floods. So uh, about 50 years ago, an old rice variety that's no longer eaten was discovered that's tolerant to submergence. They had this amazing property. So it could be flooded for two weeks. And after the flood was removed, this rice plant could survive the flood. Using uh, conventional approaches, breeders tried to introduce this trait into modern varieties grown by farmers in India and Bangladesh. But they failed to produce a variety that was accepted by the farmers. And that's because when you use conventional breeding without the knowledge of genetics, you drag in lots of uncharacterized traits that change the texture, the flavor, the flowering time, and different aspects of the rice. So 
my uh, collaborator, I was part of a, a fortunate to be part of a collaboration uh, started about 10 years ago to try to isolate the gene encoding tolerance to submergence. And we were able to isolate the gene. It's called uh, submergence tolerance 1A. And this shows you an experiment using genetically engineered varieties that we developed in my lab. So the control variety looks pretty good. And these are the two lines where the gene was introduced um, using a genetic engineering approach. You can see after 16 days of submergence, the control looks pretty sick. It's long, yellow leaves. And the genetically engineered varieties look very good. And then after seven days recovery, the control is dead. And the lines that we genetically engineered look very, very good. So this is, uh, in a sense, an academic experiment because the varieties we used are not used or not grown by farmers. But it was an important experiment because we were able to prove that indeed we had the right gene, that this particular DNA sequence uh, conferred submergence tolerance. However, these uh, academic experiments stay in the lab unless you have a great collaborator, which I did. This is David McKill. He was at, we started this project um, together to try to isolate the gene when he was at UC Davis. He then moved to the International Rice Research Institute called Erie. And his goal was to translate the basic discovery to develop varieties that farmers can actually use. So we, he used, he led a um, uh, breeding project using marker-assisted breeding. So this is not genetic engineering, but this is using knowledge of the genetics to introduce this gene into varieties favored by farmers. And this shows you, um, I'm going to show you a video, this is a time-lapse video that was carried out at the International Rice Research Institute in a controlled field situation. So this is a four-month time-lapse uh, time video. variety yields threefold more than the conventional variety. And I really like to show this video because it, I believe it really shows the power of genetics, the power of a single gene to make a huge impact in farmers' fields. Now, um, Dave also led four years, years of field trial in India and Bangladesh. So what you're looking at here are farmers' fields, so not a controlled field trial. Uh, this is this, uh, another variety called Swarna that's favored by farmers in Bangladesh and India, and the new variety, Swarna sub-1. There has been increasing floods every year, possibly due to climate change, and so this, they were able to get fantastic data, um, and in farmers' field, they're seeing three to five-fold yield increase. Our team was fortunate to go visit um, the farmers in India and Bangladesh. The International Rice Research Institute uh, conducts participatory breeding programs so the researchers and breeders can meet with the farmers and um, we talk about what they need, what we're, what they want to know, what we want to know, and it was a really fantastic experience. Uh, <laughs> Because these are subsistence farmers. They often only eat rice. They don't have extra rice to sell. They don't have money to buy other types of um, foods or other types of necessities for their children, like education. So this has been a very successful project. A couple years ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation helped to uh, help breeding stations and farmers uh, self-pollinate and propagate the seed. So this is rice is a self-pollinating uh, crop. And last year, 4 million farmers grew a submergence tolerance rice. So now I'm going to talk about another project. This is not work that I have uh, in any way involved with, but I've been watching this project develop. This is vitamin, uh, this is a project to address vitamin A deficiency. So this is a, a deficiency that afflicts the world's poorest children whose rice are, are based, mostly, diets are based mo mostly on rice. See, you know, academics, they get a bit early, so get tongue-tied. Okay, 
So vitamin A deficiency causes nearly 500,000 children to go blind every year. More than half of those children die within a year. This is not a disease that we see in Berkeley or Davis. So the Rockefeller Foundation, a nonprofit foundation, funded a project to uh, develop golden rice, genetically engineered rice. So the rice on the left was developed through genetic engineering. It's expressing beta carotene, which is a precursor of vitamin A that's made in our bodies. So this pigment is, is due to the beta carotene. This is the same pigment you see in, in carrots. And this is a conventional rice. Now this rice is um, expected to be released in, in the very near future, perhaps next year. All a farmer needs is one seed. Again, um, I want to stress this is a nonprofit project. The pharma, all the reason the farmer needs one seed is because one plant produces 500 seed. So they can collect the seed, replant it, um, and eat it. So, so most farmers in these countries would, would do both. Um, so I want to mention uh, my last example is banana. 100 million people in East Africa rely on banana as a staple food source. Again, it's not something we think too much about here, uh, but it's a very important staple food after rice, wheat, and maize. Bananas, like all plants, are susceptible to disease. And banana is particularly vulnerable because there are um, very few uh, banana varieties that are grown. And in Africa, there, is the, the, there are some varieties grown, but they're all susceptible to this disease. So what you're looking at is a banana stem. It's cut in half, and the bacteria is oozing out of the stem. The farmer, there are some uh, cultural methods to control this disease. The farmer can cut off the male flower. They can try to use uh, clean instruments, but these are very inefficient. And this is an epidemic that's sweeping through East Africa. There's no, uh, again, conventional method to control this disease. And there are um, no naturally known resistance genes out there. So banana is very difficult uh, to carry out breeding. So um, for a number of years, I've been working on a related disease that infects rice. So this is a, a, a xanthomonas disease of rice. We had isolated a number of years ago a rice gene called XA21. So we had a very simple um, idea. Can we introduce the rice gene and put it in banana? And then maybe we can get resistance to banana xanthomonas well. So the work was carried out primarily by Lena Tripathi at the International Institute of Trop Tropical Agriculture in Kenya. She developed um, several different transgenic uh, bananas, genetically engineered bananas, uh, expressing the rice gene. And on the left is a typical experiment in her greenhouse where the banana is infected with uh, xanthomonas. And on the right are two out of seven genetically engineered uh, bananas that are completely resistant to disease. So we're very hopeful if this can be replicated in field trials, and those are just starting now, if it can be replicated, we believe this will be a very useful and exciting tool for farmers in Eastern Africa. So um, I want to just give you an idea of how exciting plant genetics is. I'm going to pull you away from your business degree and your social studies degree and your journalism degree, and you're all going to rush over to the uh, UC Berkeley Plant and Microbial Genetics Department because it's just so exciting. Um, so just to give you an idea, in the year 2007, the Rabidops, Rabidopsis genome was sequenced. This is a Rabidopsis. It's just this little plant. It grows in petri dishes. Um, it grows all around the world, but it's sort of the fruit fly of plant genetics. It's very easy to carry out genetic experiments. It has a very small genome. It was the first plant genome to be completely sequenced. It took seven years, 500 people, and $70 million. Kind of expensive, right? Well, this year, the same project can be carried out in two days and costs $180. So this gives you an example of how fast plant genetics is moving. And not only do we have the sequence of Arabidopsis, but we have the sequence of corn, we have the sequence of rice, of banana, of wheat, and, and more and more plant species every year. Not only do we have the sequence of one variety, but we have sequences of many different varieties. So we have this huge amount of genetic diversity that we can now capture and bring back into our crop plants, either through marker-assisted breeding or genetic engineering or other types of new genetic uh, techniques that are being developed every year. Now, <clears throat> last 
question. Are genetically engineered crops safe to eat? Clearly, this has become um, a question that his uh, consumers really want to know. And sometimes it's very difficult to get the information. And I wanted to give you um, an example of two recent stories. Get, you have to pay attention now, wake up, because you're going to get another clicker question. So on May 19th, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine called on physicians to educate patients, the medical community, and the public to avoid GM foods and provide educational materials concerning GM foods and health risks. That's a pretty clear statement. But then there's another statement. AAAS scientists conclude genetically engineered crops on the market are safe to eat. A September 2013 editorial in a magazine stating that GE crops on the market are safe to eat and have environmental benefits, and that every genetically engineered crop has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, you get a vote, A or B. Which position do you think most people find credible? It can be what you find most credible or what other people find most credible. And the answer is A. So most people find the American Academy of Environmental Medicine that their statements to be the most credible statement. So now I'm going to give you a little more information, and then you get a vote again. <laughs> what is AEM? AEM is an organization that you can look up on quackwatch.org. Now, I love this site, Quackwatch, because it's not only plant genetics that has all kinds of um, strange information out there, but any, you know, or, uh, supplements or, um, you know, different home homeopathic remedies, vaccines. I mean, there's all kinds of health information. So this is a group of nonprofit scientists. It's a network of people that are concerned with health-related frauds. Um, it was founded in 1969, incorporated as a nonprofit in 1970. It's a little bit difficult to navigate the site, but it's really the best site out there for trying to sort out um, truth versus fraud. Now, the other statement was an editorial in the magazine Science, which is one of the leading scientific journals uh, in the world. And the organization is American Association for the Advancement of Science. The people that wrote the editorial was Philip Sharp, Nobel Laureate, Institute Professor, President of AAAS, Donald Kennedy, President Emeritus, Stanford University, former Editor-in-Chief of Science, Bruce Alberts, and Martin Rees. And not only have um, these four scientists come to this conclusion, but the National Academy of Sciences put out position papers saying the exact same thing. The crops on the market, currently on the market, are safe to eat. That doesn't mean every genetic engineering is safe to eat. Everything has some risk of unintended consequences. But the crops out there are safe to eat, and they have benefited the environment. The World Health Organization has come to the same conclusion. The European Food Safety Authority and every single scientific organization that has looked at these specific questions has come to the same conclusion. The crops that are currently on the market are safe to eat. So let's just see. If you vote again, if it changes at all. It may not. So let's um, vote again. The last clicker question. So you, now you vote again A, 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 E, M, or B, A, 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 S. So of course, I put up these acronyms, because what's a consumer supposed to know the difference between A, A, E, M, and A, 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 S? It's not that easy to figure out. But if you go to um, leading professional uh, scientific societies or Quackwatch, you can figure it out. All right, so little information goes a long way. OK, thanks. So just to conclude, uh, we really need to advance sustainable agriculture using the most appropriate technologies. And Raul and I believe that we should not be distracted by the method that the seed is developed. We really need to focus on the three pillars of, of sustainable agriculture, social, economic, and environmental uh, aspects. So we need to ask. If, is the food safe to eat? We need to ask if a particular crop can benefit the rural poor. Can a particular crop be economically viable for farmers? We need to have our farmers. 
we need to ask if a particular crop or farming practice can benefit the environment. And that includes sparing land and water and reducing uh, toxic inputs. So just to summarize, again, uh, really the main point I want to make is that both improved seed and agroecological farming practice are critical to feeding the world without further destroying the environment. The term G GMO is, is really not informative. There's no scientific basis for ruling out genetic technologies as a tool for sustainable agriculture. Each seed must be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is what's probably very frustrating for most consumers. We can't generalize. So imagine what the world will look like if we don't make any changes to our agriculture. We know the answer to that. We know that we will increasingly lose ecologically, ecological niches. We will have not enough food. We'll have increasing conflict. We know we need to make changes. So this is my call to action. Go beyond your trust filters. Many of us trust our friends, our families, our political parties. Um, you really need to get uh, uh, accurate information. And if you think about the debate on global climate change, in 2006, 100% of the elected Republicans to Congress rejected the science behind climate change. 99% of scientists will tell you that the climate is changing due to human activities. So again, this concept of scientific consensus is very, very important. You can always find exceptions. But the, the science itself is very clear. And you can go to any of these uh, organizations that I mentioned to read their statements. Consider your source. If AEM puts out a statement, take a look uh, to see who is AEM. Often these organizations pop up in response to a particular issue, or often they're trying to sell you something. So get science-based information. I recommend the National Academies, the most prestigious professional organization in the United States. I'm going to recommend uh, my blog, biofortified.org. This is our mascot. But I can't take uh, too much credit for it because uh, former undergraduate at UC Davis, uh, Carl Harl von Mogel, and his colleague, Anastasia Bodnar, two graduate students, started this blog when they were graduate students. It's all nonprofit, uh, no corporate funding. Ask any question you want. Somebody will answer your question. There's a lot of information there. And I also want to highlight ucbiotech.org. It's a really tremendous resource developed by Peggy Lameau here at UC Berkeley. It, probably all of your questions are there. You can get science-based, uh, nonpartisan information, again, uh, nonprofit. Seek out farmers. And um, certainly, you're, you're meeting farmers at farmer's market. But seek out more farmers. So, Seek out farmers that grow genetically engineered crops. Ask them why. I have been to a lot of uh, debates and dialogues and panels. It's very rare, rare to have a farmer on the panel. I think we have to change that. We have to get farmers on the panel. Um, this is at farm girl Jen, Jenny Schmidt. She's a third generation farmer in Maryland. She grows 1,200 acres. I urge you to look at her uh, Twitter feed and her blog, The Foodie Farmer. And she grows organic crops, conventional crops, genetically engineered crops. Uh, she's full of information. Talk to geneticists. You have some of the best uh, plant geneticists in the world here on the UC Berkeley campus. Go, go talk to them. Seek them out. Ask them what they're doing, why they're doing it. Uh, talk to breeders. Oh, this is a uh, foodie farmer girl who I just met last week. And think globally. Think beyond your community. Think beyond California. We are uh, fortunate to have some of the richest farmland in the world. And until recently, we had a lot of water, too. So think globally. Think about that uh, poor rice farmer in India or the banana farmer. So really, that's what I want to say. We have the tools and the know-how to um, create the crops that we need to enhance sustainable agriculture. And we really need everyone at the table, breeders, students, geneticists, uh, farmers, uh, policymakers, and uh, we definitely need philanthropists to help us uh, in this goal. So just to close with a quote by Jacob Bronowski, who is a uh, philosopher, was a philosopher and mathematician. We live in a world which is penetrated through and through by science. We cannot turn it into a game by taking sides. No one who has read a page by a good critic or a speculative scientist can ever again think that this barren choice of yes or no is all that the mind offers. So thank you very much.
Some of the hardest clicker questions we've had. And I'm still not sure I understand it. My microphone on? That's why we have a Q&A. There we go. Is it on now? Yeah. Um, God, I have a lot of questions. But the students have a lot of questions, too. And I'm going to start with one from a student, um, Jennifer Nicole Pilecki. Um, and she asks, and I'll preface this by, by saying, because the same question occurs to me after I'd read your article in the, in the New Boston Review, um, that, which is that Americans are not inherently hostile to new technologies. Um, we, we generally embrace them um, less critically than people in some other countries. Uh, and when GM began, the first product was the Flavor Saver Tomato, which actually got a kind of nice press. I remember the send-off in the New Yorker to this, you know, somebody went out and tasted it. Um, so then that raises this issue of how did we get here to this point where it is so controversial. And the student, uh, Jennifer, says, if there are no documented adverse health or, env or environmental effects of consuming, producing GMOs, where did the negative stigma come from? And why is it still a major concern for the average consumer? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And I, I'd say there's no easy answer. I, I think that there has been a lot of um, fear mongering. I mean, take a look at the vaccine debate. I don't know if you've talked about the vaccine debate. But it's very clear that vaccination saves lives. Yet, when I, my children went to seventh grade, a parent stood up and said, I don't want to vaccinate my child because it causes autism. Well, that has been discredited over and over and over again. But did, that sure lingered. Probably some of you in the audience still believe that vaccinations are dangerous because they cause autism. That was driven by um, an actress. So often there are some very charismatic people that will create this kind of fear. And because science seems so remote to so many people, and this idea of scientific consensus is a little bit remote too. It's really hard, I think, for consumers to um, distinguish between sort of a kind of internet fear mongering versus what the science are talking, talking about. And still, many conservative Republicans, not everybody, but many will say they reject the science behind global climate change. It's kind of this tribal identity. Um, and I think it's, it's fascinating. And many people much more eloquent than I have, have looked at this issue. And do you think that, well, first of all, there wasn't internet fear mongering in 96 when it started. And there wasn't really internet, right? <laughs> and there was also, um, there was. both political parties supported it. The Republicans and the Democrats were very supportive of biotech. So where does that fear mongering, where did it start? Why did, you know? Well, I think it got worse. Um, so. I, it's gotten worse in some areas over the years. So I mean, of course, it's still genetic. If you talk to farmers that are growing the plants and are aware of the issues with farming and that they want to reduce their herbicides and pesticides, they're the ones that have embraced it. So the fear mongering, I think, is coming out of kind of a, uh, an urban folklore. And part of it, there's an artificial uh, dichotomy that's happened because Certified organic agriculture does not allow so-called GMOs. So this is this, and organic farming is very popular for a lot of good reasons. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that well, organic farmers don't grow GMOs, so it must be dangerous. I really think that that has gotten into people's So their rejection spirits. of GM w was one of the things that led to this, you think? I think possibly. Yeah. Do you and think the industry made any errors in how they introduced this? Well, I probably. I mean, I think. There are some stories, and I actually was trying to find this. I haven't been able to find it. Maybe it was before the internet. But there are some stories that apparently Monsanto came out and said, this is going to solve all of the world's problems, all of our agricultural problems. That clearly is a gross overstatement. You don't hear people saying that now. But um, I have heard that there were statements like that that came out. So anytime you talk about um, one technology is going to solve all the problems, 
people are, are going to be rightfully skeptical. Mm -hmm. And it may also have to do with the, the products that they led with, um, right? I mean, they led yeah. with Roundup Ready, which we haven't talked about yet, and we should talk, yeah. talk about. Uh, NBT, which you did talk about, and that these were products that didn't offer the consumer any, any positives, at least that was visible to the consumer, um, because they were, they were marketed to farmers. They offered farmers certain advantages. And they were, it, in other words, it wasn't like a nutritionally enhanced product like the Flavor Saver had it been successful. This was a tomato that um, would stay, uh, it, would, it would ripen while it was still hard, I think, so you could ship it and it would have more flavor. Um, so that's one other possible explanation, that, that there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't a really good effort to build consumer support with products that people wanted to eat. Well, that's true. I mean, I think that the BT is a really excellent example because there was sort of, um, consumers were aware of this idea that we're overusing pesticides. But they weren't aware that BT was dramatically cutting the insecticides in half. So consumers were benefiting because what's good for the environment is good for consumers as well. So I think there was a lack of awareness. And then the herbicide, the Roundup Ready, is a, a really fantastic example. When I first heard about it, I thought, oh. Because what that is, it's an herbicide that can be sprayed on a crop that's tolerant of the herbicide. So farmers like it because weeds are very, very difficult to control. So the farmers can spray um, a lot less. So I had this example. Um, I didn't show the slide, ran out of time. But uh, farmers, instead of sp spraying 30 times a year uh, herbicides carefully around the field, now they can spray once with an herbicide over their entire field. Well, they could then. It's changed a little bit since then, right? I mean, it's well, taking if you're increased not, applications, and there's a lot of resistance. Well, if you're not. This is, goes back to this idea, you have to have an integrated cropping strategy. It makes no sense to spray an herbicide all over everything year after year after year, the same herbicide. It, it, we've, we've known before, long before genetic engineering started that if you treat your herbicides like that, it's, it's not good for agriculture because weeds will evolve resistance. So overuse of herbicides um, and, and not a smart strategy it won't work. But the reason that farmers like it is, is glyphosate is considered to be non-toxic. So the toxicity is, is similar to the toxicity of BT that organic farmers spray based on Environmental Protection Agency. But yeah, so I think consumers thought, oh, you know, now they're selling the genetically engineered crop and they're selling the herbicide. They're making a lot of money off of me. Well, they are making a lot of money. There's no doubt about that. But there are some benefits as well. Um, so there's a lot less tilling of the ground. And this is actually something, again, that's um, not something we think about as consumers every day. I think about it because my husband's an organic farmer, so he has to till because that's how they control weeds. When you till the ground, it disrupts um, the soil structure and it releases uh, uh, carbon that's sequestered in the soil. And the tractor going back and forth, back and forth, uses a lot of fossil fuel. So with the herbicide, when you're not of tilling the soil. With the herbicide, you can leave the crop on the ground. And so there's a lot less of the greenhouse gas emissions. So this so we'll is, talk, And we'll talk yeah. more about the environmental side. But I think we should look at food safety a little bit more, because that's very much, I think, on people's okay. minds. Well, and, and, I, and I think, I mean, what's interesting about invoking the, the vaccine debate is, of course, Europeans vaccinate more than, than uh, people do in the United States. And uh, you, you would think that uh, fear-mongering on the internet would, it would spread equally. But clearly, Europeans vaccinate more than people do in the United States. But they seem to be uh, far more circumspect about using genetically modified crops. And I, I want to ask a question by Mireille Mary Mankarian, um, who says, that, uh, Pam, you should shed light on the stigmatized science between GMOs. And we learned that Europe and the US approach this matter from opposite sides. Europe will not approve products unless they're proven safe, while the US approves products until they're proven to be unsafe. What's your opinion about that? So one thing that is to consider, and I, I, um, I find there's one thing that is really important to understand that the consensus among scientists is the same in Europe as it is in the United States. So the European Food Safety Authority has stated that the crops currently on the market are safe to eat and safe for the environment. Again, case by case, it's not a blanket statement for every new variety that's developed. And it's the same consensus that we see in the National Academy of Sciences and every scientific society that's looked at it. But somehow, I mean, you're exactly right, it's gone different ways. So why is that? Why is it that consumers in Europe have said, no, we don't want that stuff? 
Well, they kind of do want it, actually, because they're uh, importing their genetically engineered corn from the United States. So it is, is going there anyway, but they're not allowed uh, to grow it. Well, um, but, but can I perhaps just quote from the Royal Society of Canada, um, which is a respected, I mean, would you agree that that's a respected scientific authority or not really? Yeah, probably, actually, I don't know Royal right. Society of Canada, but I should. They, but they, they were uh, a, a, a I don't know convened uh, to, to monitor and craft the legislation around genetically modified crops in okay. Canada. Okay. Um, so th think of them as the AAAS of, okay. of, of Canada. They're probably and not on Quack Watch then. Th probably not on <laughs> Quack Watch. Uh, and they, 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 they were worried about the, the idea of substantial equivalence. Uh, you know, they said that the, the, the panel that they convened find the use of substantial equivalence as a deci decision threshold tool to exempt GM products from rigorous scientific assessment to be scientifically unjustifiable. And the, the British Medical Association, which I know is a, a, a respected authority, also has many unanswered questions. And the European Union itself is, uh, after having done its 90-day trials for feeding genetically modified crops to animals, is now in the process of um, uh, part of the GMO risk assessment and communication uh, of evidence exercise, GRACE, uh, is spending a lot of time and money asking, well, what sorts of tests are necessary in order to assure, assure us of food safety? So I, I, I want to just flag that what appears to be a scientific consensus is actually a little bit more fragmented. No, I think that there is a scientific consensus. The there's no political consensus. The scientific consensus that there's safe to eat, there is actually no dispute on that from any scientific society that I am aware of. But what you're talking about is how to classify substantial equivalence. But, but, you know, just to back off. Will you guys uh, uh, in, define substantial oh, yeah. equivalence? So substantial equivalence is that the new crop is substantially similar based on nutritional profiles in the old crop. And just to give you an example, two this examples. this was the, the American Food and Drug Administration uh, issued FDA. that finding. FDA issued that finding, right? Well, that has been the FDA's position always. Right. So if you consider and it's the basis of our regulation or non-regulation. Well, most crops are not regulated at all. It's only genetically engineered crops. So consider two varieties of soybean. They are substantially equivalent. They're genetically very, very different. In fact, two varieties of soybean are much, 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 much more different than a soybean that carries a snippet of a BT. So again, you know, it helps to understand. So think about papaya. So we can forget about all the scientific consensus and all these terms and acronyms. And think about papaya. Genetically engineered papaya has trace amounts of the virus. That's different than a regular papaya. But then think about an organic papaya. It has a thousand-fold more of the virus in the papaya. It's not regulated at all. So when you're eating the papaya, you're eating gobs of this virus. Well, it's harmless. But it's, that is actually substantially different than um, uh, a non-infected papaya or even a genetically engineered papaya. So even if you're not a scientist, logically, you can begin to understand, I think, how these decisions are, are made. I want to press a little harder on that idea of consensus, though, because this is another way. You really liken the climate change consensus and you're not the only one. I mean, a lot of people uh, are talking about this, this liking between there's a consensus on climate change. Climate change is happening, and it's caused by humans. And there is a consensus on the safety of genetically modified crops. Uh, and I, I just want to think that through a little bit. It's a, it's a, it's a superficially very attractive idea. Uh, and it certainly confounds people on the left, especially, which I think it was designed to do. Um, but it seems to me a consensus about a scientific fact, like there is or isn't climate change, is a little different than a consensus about a technology and whether society should introduce it or not. Um, and that technologies and science are not exactly the same thing. And that the decision to accept a technology is always going to be a societal question informed by science. So it seems to me that there's a, you can really define uh, a consensus on the fact that there is climate change. But as you said, you know, you can't even make a generalization that all GM is going to be safe. You're saying the ones that we have so far, we haven't found evidence of harm. Um, that's one, one issue uh, that 
we're in the realm of technology so that this will be necessarily a somewhat more political decision uh, or finding. The other is, though, if you look at what, what those consensi are constructed of, uh, on, the, on the GM side, or the GE side, as you prefer to call it, um, as you said in, in that article, um, the science, two-thirds of it was done by corporations with an interest in it, and one-third of it was independent. OK, fair enough. Um, and then on the climate change science, if we're going to weigh these two consensuses, most of it, I don't know, the overwhelming majority was either by governments or academics, and that the people dissenting from that consensus, in general, we now know we're in the employ of the fossil fuel industry. So it just seems a little unfair to scientists who are critical of GM or other people who are, you know, to, to draw an equivalence between those two things. Well, I think we have to think, okay, so the science behind the safety of genetically engineered crops is actually more substantiated than the science behind global climate change. So tell, tell us how it was arrived well, at. The reason is global climate change, we can see change, but it's very hard to predict the future. Very difficult. The modeling, very sophisticated models, I will never understand these models. We have to go with the consensus of the scientists. We're never going to understand the models. And any time you're predicting the future, the models are going to be inherently um, changeable. Genetically engineered crops have been around for nearly 20 years. We can look back. We can get empirical data. And I think that's a really important distinction. And we've been using genetically engineered medicine. Some of you, most of the cheese, 90% of the cheese that you eat is used with genetically engineered rennet. Um, the, and this idea of the technology being somehow different or more dangerous, that was the point of the slide about radiation mutagenesis. So an accepted technology that's been used for 50, 50 years, no one even paid any attention to it. But it actually clearly introduces more genetic changes than other types of genetic engineering. So I, I think what I'm just trying to say, of course people will have beliefs about a particular technology. We all have an iPhone. We hold it up to our ear. Very few people are actually questioning that technology. It's just because of our kind of our tribal um, identity. Plus, we really need those um, iPhones. Um, so I think that it's important to uh, consider the, the framework of the technology so well. how did we determine it was safe? I mean, you say we have 15 or 20 years of, of, of having eaten it, and you do point out that after all this time, we haven't found adverse health effects. And I want to talk about that uh, also. But did our government require that uh, lots of the stuff be fed to rats before it was introduced to see what happened to them? Yeah, so the only crop that's regulated are these crops that are considered genetic engineered. And I use the term genetic engineering because it's much more descriptive, I think. So if you put a, even though we eat peppers and tomatoes together, if you put a pepper gene in tomato, it's highly, highly, highly regulated. It has to be examined. It ha the gene is actually looked at. The trait is actually looked at. Now, if you do mutagenesis, which induces hundreds of changes, it's not regulated. The reason that genetically engineered crops were regulated is because that was something that um, was considered to be sufficiently different than, than before. So I think that. Well, how yeah. regulated are they? What does the FDA require to approve a genetically modified? Genetically engineered crops are uh, regulated by the FDA, the EPA, the USDA. It depends on the trait. Mm -hmm. So. For example, if you're going to put um, a, a BT gene. So BT, as I mentioned, is considered very, very, very safe. It's been used for 100 a, a years. It's used by organic farmers. You can safe get a, a profile. Pesticide. It's a safe pesticide. Well, right. we eat it. It's in the soil. So mm -hmm. it's a, something we've been exposed to. Even children you know, playing in the backyard, it's something we're, we're exposed to. So I think there, nothing can be proven safe. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be proven safe. Um, I can't guarantee that there's no risk. But you need to consider the risks and the benefits. We know that 25% of the world's insecticides are used to control this pest. We know that half of those are considered carcinogenic or potentially carcinogenic. We know that. 
We know that um, we need to have sustainable intensification. We know that we're polluting our waterways. We know that people are starving. So there's a lot of things that we do know. So that's why I think it's really important to ask the specific question about a specific crop. I don't believe you can generalize about all well, let's genetically talk specifically engineered crops. about BT. I mean, okay. I, you, you read the piece that was uh, assigned where I mm -hmm. grew, a, uh, you know, I, I too have um, experimented with genetic engineering and grew them in my garden, potatoes, uh, the new leaf potato. And I went to find out, well, how is this regulated? This goes back to the late 90s. Uh, how, how did the government assure me that this was safe? And I was really surprised at what I learned, um, which was that I went to the FDA and I said, um, so have you tested this? I went to Mr. Mariansky, who was in charge of this at the time. Uh, have you fed this to animals and seen what happens? And, um, and he chuckled and he said, oh, no, we don't do that. Um, why not? Um, well, uh, because it's a pesticide. And um, the EPA is in charge of pesticides. So essentially, on that one big crop, the FDA basically washed his hands and uh, turned it over to the EPA. The problem, though, is the EPA is a very different standard of safety than the FDA. The FDA wants a reasonable certainty of no harm in any new uh, ingredient added to our food. And the, the EPA, though, you can't, that's not what a pesticide is. You're going to have some harm with a pesticide because they're designed to kill things. So uh, the EPA's standard is more, as you said, cost-benefit analysis. And they thought, well, for a, uh, for a pesticide, this is really safe, so they approved it. So what I'm suggesting is when you say that these are highly regulated, yes, they're, they're more regulated than other crops, but I don't think people realize how lightly regulated they are at the FDA level, um, and that it is essentially that the companies themselves get to determine that a new crop is grass. Uh, which is the, the, the generally regarded as safe. The companies themselves decide this, and uh, it's a voluntary process. Um, so well, how think, is that highly okay. regulated? So let's back up a little bit as well. So plants are infected by pests and disease. There's no question it's a problem, whether you're an organic farmer or conventional farmer, whether you have the best farming practices possible. There's always going to be pests and disease. These pests and disease, can they can deposit mycotoxins in your crop. They can create wreak havoc. They can cause starvation. All farmers use some kind of pest control. Organic farmers use pest control. Organic farmers are allowed to use rotenone or pyrethroids, pyrethroids naturally occurring pyrethroids. These are considered um, to be about a hundredfold more toxic than Bt. So it's the dose that makes the poison. Um, my husband doesn't like, even though these can be certified organic, he doesn't use these very often because they're very, very toxic. Bt is considered uh, uh, to be the least toxic of any compound. And so I can't um, assure you about anything. Mm -hmm. But this is why I think it's really important to go to this concept again of regulation and again, of consensus. So we get vaccinated. Who knows what's in those vaccines? It creates a lot of issues. We go to the doctor, we take pills, we eat new foods. You can't guarantee that anything is safe. Mm -hmm. So you just really have to make the best choices. And people that are really, really skeptical or believe there's a conspiracy, I don't believe there's any kind of conspiracy out there to I don't force either. us. Yeah. But if you are really, really, really afraid, you can always eat certified organic products, because those don't have GMOs. They do have other types of things. There is no easy way out. Every, there is some risk with everything we eat, everything we do. Right, but we do have a mechanism when we introduce other new things in our, into our food supply. Uh, we regulate additives, for example, and there is a system to prove the safety of additives. That's that actually not true. A political decision was made to uh, essentially exempt GM from that process. Let by me, the FDA. Okay, let me give you a Think about the supplement industry. Completely unregulated. I agree. Completely I agree. unregulated. There are, uh, have been horrible examples where these things are mixed with things that are, that are quite toxic. There's a lot more we need to worry about. There's organic chemicals in the environment. Many are being certified every year. There are um, uh, these supplements. So it's this focus without any scientific basis, I'm going to say, hope I'm not being too bold, um, 
uh, the, uh, uh, sort of this uh, obsession about gen genes. There's something about the idea of genes that really interests people and frighten people. And um, I think it's this idea that technology is moving too fast and we have to stop the technology. Uh, and, and that's certainly a valid viewpoint, but it's not something that I think is going to happen because we have to eat, we have to feed the world, we have to control pests and disease, we have to use the best, safest approaches that, that we can. I mean, how can you tell the, the banana farmer, sorry, I know you eat rice and bananas together, but we're not going to let you put the rice gene in the banana because there's some people in Europe, some politicians, that think it might be dangerous. I mean, there's no rational reason. There's no scientific basis for that. So to, to, to deprive that banana farmer of a technology that could be very beneficial for them is, I think, it's not um, a moral choice. Well, I'm not talking about depriving anyone of anything. I'm just saying that perhaps it'd be possible to do a little more extensive testing, scientific when, testing. When do you than stop? We have. What when testing? Do I, well, when, what, where, when uh, do you what, start? When I mean, do you stop? <laughs> yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. I know that, so 20 years of testing, 30 years of testing, 40 years of testing, 50 years of testing. No, but, it, there, but it's actually, when you look at the record, the, the amount of testing done has been, um, we just had our first long-term trial, a feeding trial, of a Roundup product, which, as you know, has been very controversial but the first one to go beyond 90 days. And the reason we even had any 90 days studies, feeding studies, was because the Europeans, Europeans insisted on it. We never did in this country. It's, you don't need to test uh, the safety. The only thing you need to do in America is test the allergenicity in vitro, in a test tube, of these new uh, proteins. So I, I'm just suggesting it's not an all or nothing. It's like, no, we shouldn't have this. I'm, I'm, I, I definitely believe we need to research this. And you presented some very good best cases applications for this technology. Um, but, I, I, but I think that there are real questions. When, we, when we're talking about a scientific consensus, that needs to be based on a lot of science. So in Europe, in, in England, they had five, they just did like a huge study, $500 million, 500 independent research groups, um, 25 years of research, crops on the market are safety, safe the environment, reviewed every kind of safety study. They excluded any study they thought had a conflict of interest. It's not only England and the United States. There are many long-term safety studies. I can give you some references. And the study that you're referring to was, I believe, the Seralini, the infamous Seralini mm -hmm. study. So this is a study where a scientist um, basically went to the press and he said, I have rats that have cancer. And of course, these rats, the, he picked some rats that always have cancer. He didn't just go cancer. to the press. <laughs> he published a peer-reviewed article but and then went, had a press conference. Yeah, he had a press conference, but he demanded that no journalists be there, uh, no scientists be there to question his results. So this is a long, sorted story. Um, and the paper was retracted. Uh, every scientist around the world um, who looked at it said the, the data was inadequate. So that study doesn't exist. A paper's retracted. It doesn't exist and, and anymore. The, and the, the trial is being redone by the European Food Safety Administration. So maybe we'll get something we can all agree is a more um, yeah. uh, trustworthy study. But it was, it was a very unusual. I mean, one of the things that's happened, this is another problem with this consensus, is anyone who defies the consensus is, is you know, pretty roundly attacked really no, quickly. No, no, I, I really don't believe that his person was attacked. The science was retracted. I've had a paper retracted. You retract a paper if the data is not accurate. You retract a paper. And in his case, he, he, he didn't voluntarily retract it. It had to be retracted because it, it wasn't really science. And, and unless, so in the scientific method, it has to be done in a way that's peer reviewed. It has to be, you can't just say, well, I did some statistics. I think this is the way it is. That's not the way science works. It's not one person's opinion. It's a process. And I, I, I like that idea, um, that the, 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 there, there should be a process, uh, and that there, the, there should be you know, a, a, a number of schools of thought. And I, and I, I am hearing that, that with things like Quack Watch, uh, that, that there's a, an attempt to, 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 sort, to sort out superstition from good science. Uh, but I wonder, 
whether the, the, the sort of war on skepticism here is, is going a little bit far. far. I mean, I, I, I like, I mean, it seems that we both agree that, that climate change is, is a kind of interesting gold standard for understanding peer review and getting good science out of a process. Or vaccination or creationism, all these things are well, well, so, very so let's, interesting. Let's go, let's go with the IPCC, though, the, the International Panel on okay. Climate Change, um, which uh, a man called Robert Watson uh, chaired. He, he was at NASA, and then he was the World Bank's chief scientist. One of the other things that Robert Watson did uh, was, together with 900 other people and 120, 110 countries, was run the International uh, Agricultural Assessment on Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development. Uh, people who have been awake in the class will know uh, that that's something that, that, uh, that, that's come up a couple of times before. Um, and I, I like Bob Watson's approach to, to skeptics. And he, he said when, when the IPCC, when the, the climate change panel uh, was being challenged for, for, for actually leaning too much in, 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 in exaggerating the, the dangers of climate change, he said, look, you should always be challenged by skeptics. The, IPV, uh, the IPCC's job is to weigh the evidence. If it can't be dismissed, it should be included in the report. Point out it's in the minority, and if you can't say why it's wrong, just say it's a different view. And what I'm seeing with the, climate, uh, with, with the GMO debate is that every trace of anything that could possibly be considered uh, a contrarian view is being crushed. Uh, and that's a very different, and it seems to be non-scientific approach. It seems anti-scientific. Well, I think we have to look at it this way. I put up all those organizations for a reason. Those are the leading scientific organizations in the world. These represent thousands of scientists. Mm. Okay, you don't believe one person, but when you have this massive amount of scientific information, consensus, there's actually not a single study that I'm aware of that refutes the consensus, except for this Seralini study that was retracted. And it, you may believe that it's possible to believe that these thousands of scientists are part of kind of some kind of, again, this conspiracy idea, but I really have not seen that in my entire career of a scientist. I've never felt that there was kind of this, this force or this, this idea that was crushing crushing skepticism and crushing good ideas. Science is all about um, peer review and publication and replication and reproduction. And after 30, 40 years of using the technique of genetic engineering, there's not a single, a single paper that, that has any rational reason for thinking that this particular technique of genetic engineering um, is going to have much higher risk of unintended consequences. And it goes back to this idea of risk of unintended consequences. I cannot guarantee that there is no risk. There is always a risk. But the risk of unintended consequences for this method that can be certified organic is higher. So why, I mean, asking you this question, why is it that mutagenesis, there was no controversy over mutagenesis, when clearly it in introduces much, much greater changes? Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because it didn't come to people's consciousness in the same way? Well, I don't think, you know, when you look at the history of GM, there was uh, concern on the part of the scientists who discovered the technique, and they all got together to Silomar in 1975 because they realized they were playing with something very powerful and very novel. Uh, and when Monsanto introduced the products, they made a lot of its novelty, and as you said, their extravagant promises what it could do. Um, so I think that um, there was a recognition at the beginning, and as you've demonstrated with some of these examples, it's, it's a very powerful new technique. Um, I, I think you do us a disservice by mushing all genetic alteration together. I mean, I think that if we had more time, we could perhaps, or if we had another scientist sitting here, we could perhaps draw a line. Um, and that, you know, one of the things that I think is different, and tell me if I'm wrong scientifically, is that we're, these are transgenic um, uh, products, right? I mean, you're taking the genes from one species and putting them in another. To a lot of people, that was uh, crossing some sort of line. It was something new. And I realize it does happen in nature, but it's usually in the form of a disease, right? An agrobacterium or another disease smuggles its DNA into a, a, a creature. So I think for a lot of people, I mean, you're asking me why I think this happened. I think that was it. When people heard about flounder genes being put in tomatoes, there was something kind of viscerally, this is weird and scary, whether it should have been or not. Well, that's a good point. When I think that the technology 
you know, I'm obviously a scientist at technology. I, again, I, you know, I'm not worried about the technology. I understand some people are worried about the technology, but perhaps it's more helpful to think about the trait and the reason the technology is being used. So think of golden rice, for example. Think about, you know, 500,000 children going blind every year. Um, there have been many programs over the years to help them grow a more diverse diet. There's been programs for vitamin A supplementation tablets that they can take. Another technology, another approach has been to genetically engineer the genes into the crop. It's expected that after that golden rice is introduced, it'll probably save the lives of a thousand children in the first year, thousands of children. So you're looking basically at um, a fear of a technology, of something new, versus with, with no evidence that there's any harm, versus a very serious vitamin A deficiency. If it was your children, what choice would you make? Well, another way to look at it, though, is that, and, and that this, this speaks to a lot of the cases we've looked at, is that how did we get here? I mean, that maybe we shouldn't obsess as much on the technology and, as you said, deal with issues like, uh, sustainability. And, and then the reason that we have this vitamin A deficiency, as I understand it, is that we have people eating a, a monoculture diet. They're not getting the things that give you vitamin A. They're not getting vegetables, right? They're eating rice. And so, in a way, it's the public health version of the, of the environmental problem of monoculture. A lot of the, the problems to which GM poses, offers an answer, uh, are the problems of monoculture. But of course, those problems could be addressed in a more systemic way. How do well, you diversify the diet? How well, do you, you know, I mean. But Michael, you know that, that there has been um, many efforts, 50 years of efforts, and, and ongoing efforts, really critically important efforts to try to diversify the diet. But think about a child in a city of 20 million people. This is going to be a typical size of a city in India. 20 million people. These parents maybe don't have a job. The child is maybe only eating rice. Clearly, it would be better if they had a backyard garden. No one is going to argue with that. Come to Davis. We have these huge gardens, right? But it's not that simple. How are we going to feed the world? And it's not just that we have to deliver staple food crops where the calories are. We have to deliver um, nutrients. Those nutrients obviously can come in the form of a diverse crop, but how do, you, how do you get that crop to those children that are dying in the inner cities in India? It's not so simplistic. I think for those of us, again, that live in California, we can, we can hardly imagine it. You really have to go visit. But Pam, I, but so, so I did that. Uh, I, I was curious about what farmers in Africa, and I have to say there was something that rubbed me the wrong way about the representation of farmers in Africa in some of those pictures as begging. Uh, when oh, that was from the food crisis in 2008. Right, uh, and, uh, and, and I, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, doing work in sub-Saharan Africa, and the farmers are not as, um, uh, uh, farmers are also capable of and have been successful in diversifying their diets despite genetically modified crops. And I, I, I went to Makatini, where the, which is meant to be a showcase of, uh, Makatini is in northern KwaZulu-Natal, and uh, in 2000 and, when was it, 2003, uh, a man called Robert Horsch uh, testified in Congress. He was, uh, at that point, a vice president for product and technology cooperation at Monsanto. Uh, and he said that he'd visited this place, and uh, a farmer there, TJ Butalezi, had uh, come up to him and said, for the first time, I'm making money and I can pay my debts. Uh, Robert Horsch is now at the Gates Foundation, but uh, TJ Butalezi is now in trouble. I mean, w w when I went back there two years later, uh, the BT cotton crop had, uh, had, had experienced its initial yield boost, and now the, the yields were lower. Uh, they were having problems with secondary pests, as, as you notice. Uh, you know, so the, 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 the toxins uh, that BT cotton produces are not always effective in dealing with the, the full spectrum of things. And the technology that, that, that was, that was there for these farmers uh, was useful in playing out a, a sort of puppet show in Congress, it seemed to me, uh, in, in the early uh, 2000s. But it didn't seem to be helping farmers all that much. And that's why the paper we wrote was called Can the Poor Help GM Crops? Uh, it's, I mean, the, the, the reason that, that, that it seemed to me that, that African farmers were useful is in helping move the debate forward in the United States, rather than this, uh, the, the, the discussion about whether we can be helping farmers in 
uh, the global south. Because again, it, when it comes to reports like ISTAT, which uh, you know, Robert Watson's uh, report that, that points to the fact that uh, you know, GMO yields are, are variable and in some cases declining, uh, they, they point to other ways in which crops can be diversified. I mean, I, I, I wonder if, if you can see other ways in which crop diversification can happen and in which vitamin A uh, intake can be increased other than by merely splicing it into rice. So I think my point really is, it's not an either or. I really think it's important for the audience to, to get this idea. It's not either this or that. But use the best technology and the best farming practices for a particular problem, okay? So you're a, an eggplant farmer in Bangladesh, for example. They spray a lot of insecticides. Eggplant's the most important vegetable. They spray a lot of insecticides. So you could stop growing eggplant. You could grow something else, right? But there is a, a big demand for eggplant. These farmers are probably getting a lot of money from even selling it to people. If they grow something else, maybe they don't get the money. So anyway, you can choose to grow something else. You can choose to grow eggplant. You can choose to spray an insecticide. You can choose to grow BT eggplant. I really think it's important that the farmers make that choice. I really feel that when we sit in <coughs> our urban centers and try to dictate what a farmer should do, I think that's a mistake. And, and an organic farmer will tell you that too. So I think farmers need to be able to choose the technology that's good for their farm, their family, and to foster their soil for generations to come. And I, that's what I really like at Farm Girl Gen. Talk to, I mean, you did. You went out and talked to, to some farmers. I think it's really important to talk to farmers and ask them why they're making those mm. choices. And, and by the way, in, in that graph that you showed of uh, more developing countries now adopting uh, GM crops, uh, I, I got the impression that it, you, you were saying it was small farmers who were driving that, but that's not true, is it? It's, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it, it's uh, farmers mainly in Brazil, uh, particularly in the soy monocultures, that are driving the, the particular uptake of genetically modified crops at the moment. Well, the, the Indian cotton growers are a big, big part of that, and Chinese cotton growers. So those are very small farms. So I, I, Argentina, too, so there was, but I don't know, is Argentina considered, uh, it's not considered quite as poor as uh, I, mean, I imagine it would be considered a developing country, but the, 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 the uptake of uh, GM crops there, is, it, it seems to me, is uh, It's also is, is very big. Yeah. Right. Um, so again, I mean, I, I, I wonder whether that points us towards the question uh, that uh, Abigail Bethany Taylor and Eric DeWitt uh, Real uh, have, have asked about monocultures. And, and they're asking, well, look, doesn't, isn't the problem that GMO solves a problem about monoculture? And so isn't GMOs, that unsustainable? This idea of GMO solving a problem, so a couple things that I, um, I really would like to remove from the question. This idea of GMOs, because every genetically engineered crop is different, every seed is different, so it's really important to be specific. You know, for example, is BT eggplant um, creating a problem of monoculture? That would be a really uh, useful discussion. I think to get to the specificity of the question is really important in these conversations. Otherwise, we can't have, can't have dialogue, because you can't, um, group all GMOs together. We can't compare um, rice, golden rice, with the BT cotton in Arizona, because there are different types of farmers, different consumers, different traits. So it's not something that, that can be grouped together. And so for monoculture, it's a problem whether um, it's genetically engineered or not genetically engineered. So the issue with monoculture, you probably talked about it, is if you plant one seed for a long time over one large area of land, it increases the vulnerability to epidemics because pests and disease evolve. Um, and so it's not a good idea to plant a monoculture. But sometimes it's hard for the, I mean, we have this experience a little bit with our um, submergence tolerance rice. It's not genetically engineered, but it's used marker-assisted breeding. So farmers were already growing a lot of Swarna over a large, large area. Now they're growing sworn as sub one. The other farmer, you know, your neighbor sees that you're getting fourfold higher yield. You want, you want that seed as well. And so who is to dictate how to diversify the crop? It's not, it's not really that simple. I mean, I think good farmers in the United States, and again, you can take a look at that farm girl, Jen, she has this huge diversity of crops. Very highly educated farmers rotating the crops. But not, not all farmers are gonna make that choice. But you agree that there are alternative ways to solve, say, a weed problem and a pest problem. I mean, your husband 
uses them, right? I mean, highly diverse farms tend to decrease the weed pressure and, and decrease the insect pressure. Well, weeds are a problem. He hates weeds. There's no good method to control them. Right, and it's a you It's a problem. Yeah. The reason conventional growers are using this Roundup Ready crops is it's really effective for weed control. A lot of people don't want to spray any herbicides, which is understandable, um, but it is very effective. And talk to any organic farmer, they're very frustrated with weeds, and they have to till and till and till. Which is which bad, can, as you say, yeah. is bad for the soil. So there's but let's no talk simple. a little bit about um, the, now that we have the 17 years of experience with GM, what have we gotten for it? And, just, I, and now I'm going to be a little less specific because we have to talk about it um, in general. But 99% of the genetically modified acreage is, uh, I believe, is BT and Roundup uh, crops. Okay, so that the some of the examples you're showing us, like the papaya, are um, sound like terrific ideas and real contributions and solving a problem that couldn't be solved another way. Um, but they do represent a small part of the whole story. And by and large, what we have gotten is a lot of Roundup and a lot of BT. On the Roundup side, after 17 years of um, spraying a lot of Roundup, uh, we have a, a tremendous problem with um, resistant weed. Uh, more than 50% of the farms now have resistant weeds. People, farmers are struggling with pigweed in particular. Um, and so now they're starting to mix it with other herbicides because it's not working as well. Um, does that strike you as an adverse environmental uh, impact of these so GM I think, crops? So I think when we talk about Roundup, it really is important to think about those farms, what they were spraying before Roundup. They were spraying uh, herbicides that were considered to be uh, moderately toxic and persist in the groundwater. The reason farmers shifted so dramatically to glyphosate is because it's considered non-toxic. Right. It's similar to the BT Less spray. Toxic. Non toxic Non-toxic. It's the same toxicity as BT that organic farmers spray. So that is why there's this big, been this big shift. And farmers like it because it's less toxic for the farm workers. They don't have to spray as much. They don't have to till. But any time that you spray a single herbicide, it's going to create a problem. It would may have made a lot of more sense to introduce sort of a mandated integrated pest management strategy as they did with BT. But that, that wasn't done. So, you know, it is possible to just ban the use of the herbicide because, again, it's not the genetic engineering that is creating uh, resistant weeds. It's spraying the herbicide. Right, but it's hard in the real world, though. You, you can't surely divorce the product and the way it was sold over so many different crops and so many different uh, acres by Monsanto, by and large, from its effects in terms of resistance. Well, think about it this way. So for 15 years, we've had massive reduction in the toxicity of the herbicide. There are some groups now that are pushing this kind of non-GMO crops. And there was a great story on NPR by Dan Charles just last month what are they doing on these non-GMO crops? Well, they don't have the advantage of organic because they don't need to do um, organic practices. And they don't have the advantage of, 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 of modern plant genetics. So what they're doing is they're going back to older herbicides, older pesticides, more toxic products. So I think that so you can't say that um, introducing Roundup Ready crops is solving weed problems. It's not going to solve weed problems. You have to integrate the pest, manage, the pest management strategy. And, I, and you know what farmers often do is they rotate their crops every year. They don't always necessarily even spray the herbicide. A really good farmer is going to pay very, very close attention um, to what they do. But as a result of this phenomenon caused by the overplanting or the overspraying of, uh, of Roundup, of course, now we're going back to those old herbicides, right? The next generation herbicide tolerant crops being introduced by uh, DuPont and uh, Monsanto are going to be 2,4-D tolerant and um, dicamba tolerant, which are exactly the pesticides that everyone was so happy to get off of uh, and use Roundup instead. So it you know, sounds not, like the same old pesticide treadmill. Well, it, I'm not advocating everybody spray Roundup. I think that as 
it's important to consider that you can ban herbicides. It's an option, right? So I think the issue for me as, as a geneticist is to demonize a genetic technology because you don't like herbicides. Or, or I'm agreeing with you that a lot of herbicides are not used properly. Well, I'm going to say, say properly. I love glyphosate. I, I, and, but, but it seems to me that, it, and maybe the non-toxicity or light toxicity of, uh, of glyphosate, which there are people who dispute that idea that it's non-toxic. But, but if that was a public good, we've kind of ruined it. Well, I agree that it is a public good, and it's like a once-in-a-lifetime herbicide. And to overuse it is absolutely a shame. Because but we're about to do the same thing with two other ones. To yeah. overuse them. Yeah, I mean, you know. So I think what you're advocating is to um, have an integrated pest management strategy, and I completely agree. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I'm going to give you the papaya. I think the papaya is a great idea. I eat those papayas. Um, are there any genetically modified crops uh, that you think are a bad idea? Well, I think the Roundup Ready is not a bad idea, but I think the implementation was a little faulty for exactly the reasons you, you bring up. We don't want to lose for those farmers that are using herbicides. Maybe we don't want them to use herbicides, but 99% of the farmers are. are. For those farmers that are using herbicides, we don't want them to use, lose the use of non-toxic herbicides. So I think there's some questions about that. Um, and I think BT is a fantastic technology. And the way it's been implemented in the United States is particularly fantastic because there was a mandated integrated management strategy. Farmers here had to, had to plant refuges at the same time, and you talk a little bit about that. In places where farmers don't need to plant refuges, that, That's an area refugia. where you, uh, you take 20% of your farm or yeah, your crop, you. and you're not supposed to use it there to, to keep a population of non-resistant insects going. Right. Right, OK. So I think, again, it's really fantastic in the United States because the farmers understand this concept of refugia. They're mandated. They're required to do this. It's been very, very successful. But it can create problems in other countries where the farmer is so happy they don't have to spray anymore, and they're just going to plant the same crop over and over again. We're going to have problems that and the insects aren't we won't. already having problems with BT insects resistant to there are corn some root, uh, uh, corn rootworm yeah yeah so yeah I mean, so and those are farmers that don't rotate their crops and that is or follow really the refuge which which I, a, a lot of farmers didn't it just kind of ignored that advice. So I there think, was no penalty for failing to do it. So you know, maybe we need to have a dictator of the farming world that you have to have integrated pest management <laughs> strategies. But uh, it's, it's tough. Farming is a very, very tough business. It's not, it's not like going to your computer and typing your neat document and doing track changes. It's, it's, it's nature. We, we're, any type of farm is destructive to the environment. Time so we for have maybe to do one more question, if you well, have the, one. The, uh, then, I mean, it does seem to me that then farmers are, ought to be given the, the, the freedom to be equal participants in this debate. And, and our own Nora Gilbert has a question about uh, the, the farming group Via Campesina. Why is it that, that, you know, 200 million farmers around the world, including in the United States, are opposed to this technology? I am not, sorry, familiar with that group. I think that BT cotton has been the fastest adopted technology a genetic technology ever. Faster adoption than the TV or the cell phone. So there may be farmers that, that don't like it, but 90% of the farmers are, are growing it. So I'm not sure what, if that answers your, your question. Who are the farmers that are not growing it? Well, th there's an international peasant group called La Via Campesina, and they have, uh, th they have their suspicions about Monsanto. They have their suspicions about uh, industrial monoculture, and they have a vision for growing that it does involve a diversified farming system and farming agroecologically, much in the same way as, say, the ISTAD report recommends, or uh, a, a number of sort of peer reviewed publications have pointed to, to helping farmers increase their, uh, the, the level of diversity on their farms and uh, making them much more resilient to climate change, a range, a range of other benefits. Um, so they find that the concentration of power in the food system that has accompanied genetically modified crops is reason in itself to be concerned. Uh, and th what they're interested in is asking the question not uh, how do we compare 
conventional agriculture to genetically modified agriculture, uh, but instead what would be the bigger alternative between conventional and something way, way, you know, way more, more radical based in science, uh, but something that much more, uh, that, that takes us far away from industrial monoculture as it looks like at the moment. Well, I mean, this sounds like a fantastic organization. And uh, again, I think agroecology is really, really critical. And I think that um, it's, it's important not to equate this concept of industrial agriculture with genetic engineering. I hope I gave you enough examples to understand that, you know, papaya, rice, banana, this isn't industrial agriculture as, you know, usually people think about corn, right? So I think that, um, and it is true that many of the genetic technologies are tied up with some very major uh, five seed companies. As an academic, I don't like that either. We want to be able to develop technologies. We want to use these technologies. We want to have access to the seed to put the technologies in. Um, and I, I think it is a problem to have the technologies controlled by five major seed companies. We really need to have um, research funding for public institutions, foundations, you know, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Gates Foundation, they're really stepping in w where we need them. USAID is, has some really fantastic programs. It's very, very important to have an independent uh, agricultural uh, research enterprise that's independent from major corporations. So I, I'm not going to disagree with that. I, but I would say, again, as a geneticist, you don't want to equate G plant genetics or GMOs or this kind of concept with industrial agriculture because even the method of plant genetics is very, very different. There's new methods of, of genetic genome editing that are coming into play. There will always be new methods. And so you don't want to just throw that away because companies are also using the technology. Well, we didn't expect to resolve this question entirely. Uh, hopefully, uh, Pam's presentation and, 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 our, and our time together has clarified it a little bit for you, or maybe it's confused Probably it not. in a productive way. Yeah. But there's <laughs> a lot more to read on the subject, and you can begin with Pam's book, uh, Tomorrow's Table. Um, but also search the internet and, you know, check mm -hmm. out Quack Watch on your way. Um, <laughs> but can you please join me in thanking Pam Ronald? Thank you all for coming. Thank you both. Thank you.